right, welcome everybody again to another episode of Profiles of Success, How I Got from High School to Success. Uh, today joining me is James Coleman. He is a partner with Partners Life Insurance Company, um, and he's doing a, a fantastic job and to give us some time of, time of day. He has a great story that I want to, him to share with you about how he has achieved the success that he has. James, welcome to the program and welcome to my classroom. Hey, Jeff, thanks a lot, man, for having me on, man. I really appreciate the opportunity to get the opportunity, you know, to talk to the kids and everything and give them, you know, a history of my background right. and where I'm at today and what put me in that direction to make the changes to, to make the change that I made to have the success that I have today. Well, what kind of success have you had today? Well, tell us a little bit about, you know, what level you've achieved and what all, you know, how, how's life for uh, you now? How's life for you now? Hey, Jeff, life is grandstanding right now. I got involved in this uh, financial services industry just about six years ago. In the first four, uh, four and a half years, touched seven figures. You know, um, my wife and I, we also in, in the process right now of starting to track the trailer company. We just bought our first truck, getting that wow. out on the road. Uh, my daughter's 15 years old. We are uh, able to put her through flight school. So right now she's in flight school. Wow. And we also in the process of having a home built uh, from the ground up in the gated community that's going to run us about a half million dollars. Holy smokes, that is incredible. So in six years, you're able to build up that kind of empire? Yeah, absolutely, sir. Absolutely, yes. Wow. So um, I'm real curious, um, how did how did that kind of be? So, so I want to take you, take you back in time a little bit, back to when you were in high school. Can you tell me a little bit about where you went to school, you know, what, um, what kind of student were you, what were your friends like, you know, what kind of things were you doing, and, and just sort of tell me about what, what life was like in high school, were you in band, choir, you know, football, uh, whatever, I don't absolutely. know. Absolutely, first and foremost, let me start off with this, Jeff, uh, I grew up in a two-bedroom apartment with 10 brothers and sisters. Oh, no. So, yeah, so, you know, mom was, mom was on welfare, Dad was making good money, but he was giving the money to the dope man, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, I, I, I entered high school and, um, you know, my first year in high school, I was pretty excited about being in high school. Then I found myself getting around the wrong crowd because I grew up in a church, right? But mm -hmm. I found myself get, getting around the bad crowd. I got attracted to them. And I guess one of the reasons I got attracted to them, Jeff, was because I was so used to being in a strict environment with my mm -hmm. mom trying to keep all of us together and on the right path. Right. But at the same time, what I was seeing out there when I got to school, you know, hey, these people got nice things, you know, and I, and I wanted to be a part of that. But so, but I will tell you, I got good grades, but then I started going down the wrong path because I was hanging with the wrong people. And what I mean by that, when I say I was started going down the wrong path by hanging with the wrong people, I just found myself, Jeff, in and out of trouble with fighting everybody mm. to the point that my senior year of high school, I got kicked out of the school that I was in. They transferred me to another school. My first day in that school, while they was processing me in, a guy said something to me. I immediately just started fighting them. I got kicked out of that school. And so I had to get in New I grew up in North New Jersey. Right. So I had to get my mom had to get a special slip from the Board of Education called the 220 form. And it was a form that allowed you to go to this alternative school to finish getting your education. Mm -hmm. And my mom was upset with me because I had got that far and just started hanging around the wrong people. And my mom always told me that, hey, look. If you hang around those people, you're going to become just like them. You're not exempt from influence, right. you know, and at the time, hey, I thought I knew everything. Right. And so uh, I still hung around with them, sneaking out the house, sneaking off the porch and stuff like that, you know, and then fast forward, you know, I found myself involved in a drug game. Oh, no. You know, and, and, and I tell you, before I even got involved in the drug game, how everything started and you know my my psyche was different because we had gotten to a fight with some guys right i had just turned 18 years old and we got into the fight with these guys and so we got locked up my brother at the time was 17 i'm the adult so they locked me up they put me on probation gave me a fine and gave me community service and i'm sitting there saying 
wow, all I was doing was protecting my brother. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I, I completed my community service, right? And But I did not have the money to pay the fine. Oh, no. So the probation officer told me, Jeff, he said, if you don't have, it was 175 hours. Really? He said, if you don't have this $175 by Friday, we're going to lock you up. My mom didn't have it. Once again, 10 brothers, sisters, we on welfare. Dad is out there giving all the money to the dope man. My dad was out there driving tractor trailers from coast to coast. He was making good money, but the dope man got it. And so one day I just found myself sitting on the corner of Avon and 15th Street where I grew up at in the rain, just like, yo, I'm really about to go to jail. Yeah, really. Because I don't have this $150. And I don't have nobody to turn to to get it. And one of the guys on the block, hey, what's going on with you? I told him what was going on. He said, have you ever heard the story that, hey, look, I can feed you or I can, or I can teach you how to fish? And I was like, nah. He said, so I can give you the money and you can take care of that. But then that's it. Or I can show you how to make the money and you can keep making money. And so that's how I got introduced to the drug game. Oh, no. Yeah, he, he gave, gave me some product. Showed me how to turn that, turn that 150 into 300. Told me how to turn 300 into a thousand, and and and, and I ran with it. I wow. liked it. I found myself in a position that hey, look, not only did I take care of the farm, but now I got the freshest gear now, which yeah. I was I was not able to have that growing up, you know. So I found so I found myself in that cycle and got caught up and said to myself that hey, hey look. Um, 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 yeah, so I, I found myself, you know, a product of my environment. Right. And, and at the time, I was like, yo, it's cool. Everybody else doing it. I might as well do it. You know, I'm in the in crowd. And I already had a reputation for being good with my hands in the streets. And I got all these brothers and sisters. I got two sisters older than me. Everybody else is younger than me. Right. And so I had a lot of people that feared me, right? And because they feared me, they was also willing to work for me in the streets, you know, and I, I, I thought that life was good, Jeff. Isn't it crazy? I mean, you're 18 and that's what how your mindset is set, set like that. So, um, so did you ever graduate high school or did, how did, how did that play plan out? How did, yeah, how did that work? I, yeah. I, end, I ended up graduating high school, but how I graduated high school, Jeff, I ended up having to go take, some summer classes, mm -hmm. right? But I did end up uh, graduating uh, high school and getting my diploma. And so, yeah. so, so your friends were in the drug gang. You were in the drug gang. Um, obviously, you're not in that gang anymore. Um, so, what what happened? Um, it, what tell me? Tell me. I mean, I'm curious. I gotta, I gotta know. How did you get from there to where you're at now? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I tell you, Jeff. We was out there making so much money, right? That the police officers, right? The narcotic officers, the narcs as we call them, right? Mm -hmm. When they saw what kind of money we was making, they were shaking us down, right? Mm -hmm. So what I mean by they were shaking us down, they would come on the block and they'd pull me to the side. They call me high sign on the streets. They say, yo, Haas, look, it's Christmas time. Look, wife need a new fur coat. We need a vacation. If when we come back in the next couple of hours, if we don't get $5,000, I'm locking, I'm locking your whole team up. What do you think I did? Hey, hey paid the cops off, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and we, 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 we found ourselves in, in shootouts with, 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 other, with other gang members and stuff like that. We out there getting this money. Oh, and yeah. so um, I, I found myself in a situation, Jeff West, though, if you name it in the street, I did it with the exception of getting high. I never did, done drugs a day in my life. Really? And the reason why I never done drugs a day in my life, because at nine years old, I saw my father nodding and I didn't know what it was at nine years old. So I asked my mother, what's wrong with daddy? And she said, he high. And at nine years old, I associated getting high with the image of how I saw my father, yeah. which was not it. And I knew I never wanted to do that. So although I was around the people that was doing it, right? I didn't do it because I always had that image in my head that I did not want to be like my dad. Right. But Everything from, and, and hit, hit, make, let me make this perfectly clear. I'm not proud of nothing I've done, right? Mm -hmm. I also don't regret nothing I've done because it helped make me the man that I am today. Yeah. So 
everything from shooting people, kidnapping people. I, I myself been shot twice. I've done I've done six years in prison. I spent two years looking at a brick wall with mm. never ever going outside. So here's what that was for me, Jeff. Two years of never going outside, looking at a brick wall, no rain, no snow, no sleep, no sunshine, no breeze, no car fumes, can't see no grass, can't hear no birds. All of that taken away from me for two straight years. You know, one of my favorite songs in this world right now is Teddy Pendergrass, This Gift of Life, mm -hmm. because I took it for granted. I, I took it for granted, you know, and I found myself in that situation. While I was incarcerated during my six years, I ended up, I had a bullet in my leg. That mm -hmm. This was the second I, I got shot twice. So by the time... I was 21 years old. I had been shot twice and in my doing my second bid in prison, but this bid was a six year bid, wow. right? And and they they wanted to give me 25 to life, but you know, I had some money from the drug game, they had to pay the lawyer to get it down, right? And so um while I was doing my six years, I had the bullet in my leg. I picked the bullet out of my leg with a paper clip while I was locked up because I needed to get it. I get it out. And the reason why I needed to get it out because survival mode, I'm thinking, Hey, if I get into a fight and somebody hit me there, I'm out for the count. I got to get this out of you because win, lose, or draw, I got survived, mm -hmm. you know? And here's, here's what I tell you during my six years in prison, you name it. I saw it. I mm -hmm. saw people hang themselves. I saw oh, no. people, I saw, I saw grown men get raped. I saw people get thrown hot. So we got, we got, we got these little coffee pots in jail, right? right. And you take, you take the thermostat out of it. And now it can literally, if you put grease in it, you know, the temperature gets so hot, you can fry chicken in it. Right. I've watched guys take that, that coffee pot get it real hot, throw water in it, mix it with some bleach, mix it with some syrup, and mix, mix it with some magic shave, right? And throw it on people and give them third degree burns. Oh, no. Right? Yeah, because at the end of the day, hey, look, ain't no guns in jail, right. you know? And I'm like, yo, that down here is real serious, right? But at the, at, while I was there, I still, I still was doing me because it hadn't registered yet, right? And what I mean when I say it hasn't registered yet, when I was in prison, I was in prison making a thousand dollars a weekend. Now, how, I okay. was able to pace a young lady to bring the drugs in the jail, pay a guy in the jail to get the drugs and go out to the big yard and sell it. And so one day I'm coming in from, from yard movement and the correction officer snatched me up. They searching me down because now the word done got around the jail. Hey, Haas in here moving dope. Mm -hmm. and, and I said to myself, when I got snatched up, I didn't have anything on me, but I said to myself, I'm about to jeopardize being able to go home. Yeah. I'm about to jeopardize my freedom. What the heck am I doing? Yeah. And at that point, Jeff, I made a decision that I was going to come home from prison, and I said, I'm going to make six figures legally when I get home from prison. I'm going to do it in five years. I have no, I have no, no trade skill or nothing, right? right? And so uh, I ended up coming home after I'm doing my six years. And here's the, here, here's the ironic part. Here's the crazy part about it, Jeff. The same friends, right, that's supposed to be my boys, right? right? During my six years, they never came to see me. They never put no money on my books or nothing. Mm -hmm. As soon as I came home, here's what it was. Hey, what's up, Haas? Welcome home, fam. Yo, here's this dope. Get back on your feet. And I'm like, wait a minute. Hold up. Stop. Pump the brakes. Yo, son, give me half of that in cash and let me do me. Now, nah, you're going to make more money, kid. Yeah, sure you're right. So I took it. And in two weeks... I come home. Hey, look, I'm good in the hood like quarter waters and sunflower seeds, Jeff, all day, <laughs> every day, right? Yep. So I come home and, you know, word on the street, yo, how's home? And so it's easy for me because my reputation to take this package I just got and had the guys on the block go pitch it and work for me. Mm -hmm. 
And within almost two weeks, I had stacked up like $26,000. And I was sitting there, I'm fresh home. I'm, from the time I went to jail, prison and came home, so much stuff had changed, right? And so I'm sitting there saying, what am I doing? The same stuff that sent me to jail. You're doing it again. I'm back at it again, ready to go back. The mm. same people that supposed to be my mans and them is sending me, giving me the stuff to go right back where it came from. I just finished doing six years. I spent two years looking at a brick wall. I work for a dollar 65 cents a day. What's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And at that point, I made a decision that, hey, I'm going legal from this point forth. Okay. And that was in June of 97. I called my man up, said, yo, come through. He came through. I go in the closet, give him the backpack with all the money in it. I took about $300. I said, hey, look, you can have all of it. I don't want no drug money, everything from here. I'm going legal. And he was like, yo, son, you tripping. And I ain't tripping. I'm not going back. I'm not, I'm not going back, period. Wow. I made my mind up that I was going to go legal, and that's what I'm going to do. He said, well, I'm going to hold this for you because, you know, you tripping right now. I'm going to hold this for you. No, nah, you ain't got to hold You can keep all of it. I don't want no parts of it. That's when I made a decision to go legal. But I, here's what I will tell you, Jeff. Making that decision to go legal was the easy part. The hard part was following through with it. Here's why the hard part was the hard part was following through. I come from this, I came from a situation where I didn't got used to fast money on the streets and in prison. Mm -hmm. Coming home, boom, twenty six thousand in, in less than fourteen days. Mm -hmm. I get a job. 20 hours a week, Jeff. Yeah, $300. $5.75 <laughs> $5 an hour. Yep. And so I, um, one of the guys I work with told me that my boss had said something about me. I'm all cocky. I go up to my boss office. I cursed him out, called him everything in the book but a child of God. I invite <laughs> the man outside to fight me and everything. And then I told him I quit and I left. Never gave him the opportunity to open his mouth. Really? And I, I left and I went home. Now, keep in mind, Jeff, I'm on parole. One of my conditions on parole is that I have to have, have a have job. job. Yep. Right. You know, and I, I'm, I'm checking in parole. I'm fresh home, so I got to check in every single week. Now I'm thinking, like, what the heck did I just do? Right? And so um, he called me up. Right, I never, I never forget this man as long as I live. His name, Randy Weeble. He called me up. He said, "Hey, James, I don't know what you're going through, or what transpired in your mind, or what you think you heard, or whatever. Uh, but take the rest of the day off, take tomorrow off, and come back to work, and let's sit down and talk about it." Wow. I said, "Okay, cool." All right. Took the. He said, "And I'm going to pay you for those days." Right. Wow. So. I go back into work, and the first thing I do is apologize to Mr. Weeble. Mr. Weeble said, James, don't apologize to me. Be a man of your word and own it, right? Mm -hmm. I said, okay. He said, hey, look, you got something in you. You just don't know you got it in you because ain't nobody never had no faith and belief in you. Mm -hmm. He said, I got faith and belief in you, and I want you to understand that performance can't be denied. He said, you see what your problem is, James, is that you worried about what the next man is doing and what the next man is saying. Because you worried about what the next man is doing, what the next man is saying, you're limiting yourself on your ability to do what you're capable of doing. You limit yourself for believing in you. Yep. And, and it messed me up. He said, I want you to work with this guy and the other guy name is Jamie Hammer. Right? Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it because it was life changing for me, right? And he said, Jamie's gonna work with you. I said, okay. So uh, he calls Jamie in the room and uh, he, he leaves out and um, Jamie says, so I'm going to be working with you. I said, yeah. And here's what Jamie did to me. Jamie showed me his paycheck and the paycheck had a comma in it. Oh. And I said, you made that working at this sneaker store? He said, yeah. I said, the only people I know that make that kind of money is drug dealers. And you telling me you made that working here? He said, yeah. I said, can you show me how to do it? He said, yeah, I can show you how to do it, but there's three things you're gonna need to do. I said, what's that? He said, 
I'm going to need you to listen to me. I'm going to need you uh, to be quiet and I'm going to need you to work on work on yourself. And I said, hey, look, Jamie, I can be quiet. I can listen to you. But what do you mean work on myself? I had never had nobody tell me that. He said, when I mean work on yourself, James, here's what I mean. We're going to work on your character. We're going to work on your sphere of influence. We're going to work on your leadership. Those things we're going we're gonna to work with. And the first book he put in my hand for me to read was John Maxwell, 21, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Mm-hmm. And he said, we're not only just going to read this book. Every chapter, we're going to go back and we're going to recap what it is you learned. And you're going to paraphrase back to me what's your takeaway. And we're going to see how we can go out there and use some of the stuff you learned, in a, learned from a leadership perspective and implement it out there on the sales floor with the people. That's fantastic. It changed my life. So I go from making $5.75 an hour. Now, my goal was to make six figures in five years. Mind you, Jeff, I got no college education. Mm -hmm. I didn't make six figures in five years, Jeff. I made a six-figure salary in six years and two months. It ain't too bad. Uh, You know, it it, it meant from, from somebody growing up in the hood, right? 10, 10 brothers and sisters, two bedroom apartment, no college education, six years in prison, shot twice to making a six figure salary. That's I, end up, I ended up becoming a district manager for Best Buy. I oversaw wow. 11 st- in, in Manhattan, in New York, right? The, the Mecca of retail, right? I oversaw 11, st- I, had, I had seven stores in Manhattan, two in Queens, two in the Bronx, responsible for $570 million in revenue. That's incredible. No college education. Wow. 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 That's cool. So that's yeah. just because you started working on yourself, you had a mentor and you started to humble yourself and listen and take action on what you learned. I had to stop listening to me. I had to, I had, I had to change my circle. And his thing, I was okay with changing my circle, Jeff, right? And it wasn't that I kept them completely away from me. I just started to feed them from a long handle spoon. Right. Right. Because I understood, hey, as I was working on me and reading these books and developing me, I understood that, hey, I'm the sum total of the five people that I hang with. Who am I going to hang with? Am I just going to continue to hang with the cats on the block? I'm going to hang with these guys in corporate America that's making six six figures. Right. I'm going to hang with the guys in corporate America that's making that's making six figures. You know, right. I, I didn't. I no longer wanted to go to the restaurant and I gotta sit with my face facing the door because I'm worried about who's going to come in. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I know I no longer wanted to watch my back about anything. I wanted to be comfortable. Hey, I'm a family. I just decided to have a family. I'm a family man. I wanted to be able to walk down the streets and know that my family is good. Mm-hmm. Right. But not worry about, hey, somebody trying to get back at me for something I did or get at my family for something I did. Right. Drive, do a drive by and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So so you. How did you get involved with uh, Partners Life in the financial That's services really, industry? Really, really great question. Late my good old buddy, Mr. Eric McGriff, we just, you know, had his uh, home going services this past Saturday. Uh, I met him when I moved down to Atlanta. So let me tell you how I ended up moving down to Atlanta. I don't know if you can see that on my wrist right there, Jeff, but... Uh, that's the cancer symbol. My wife's a breast cancer survivor. Huh? At the time she got diagnosed with it, I was a district manager for Best Buy. And um, I wanted to transfer down here to Atlanta or down to Miami where her parents at for a better support system. Cause I got two brothers down here, two sisters down here, her parents down in Miami. Mm-hmm. So I go have a conversation with my boss and say, hey, look, I need to get transferred down to Georgia or down to Miami to get my wife closer to her family and a better support system. And my boss at the time tells me, hey, James, look, you got New York number one in the company for the past seven years running. I don't think it's a good time for us to have this conversation. Let's <laughs> review, let's revisit this conversation, excuse me, a year or two from now. No. And so I looked at him. I said, hey, look, check this out, man. I'm going to get up and leave this meeting because I'm going to say something to you. You might not like it. If you say something back to me, it's going to go left real fast. I'm just going to get up and leave this meeting. 
And I, I walked out the meeting. I called my wife's doctor and I asked her, hey, look, would you approve of me taking a leave of absence? She said, yes, James, you're your wife's caregiver. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at that point, I made a decision to walk away from a $165,000 a year salary job. Wow. Had nothing lined up, anything. Because for me, Jeff, I'm like, yo, I cannot put a price tag on my wife. That's right. You it's know, it's and, um, first. And, at this, and at this time, I think I had about 12, had about 12, almost 13 years in with Best Buy at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I walked away from it, moved down here to Atlanta. When I moved down here to Atlanta, that's when I met my, my buddy, uh, Ed McGriff, because me and his cousin grew up together. I met him in 2012. In 2013, he tried to introduce me to this insurance industry. And I was like, nah, man, get out of my face. I ain't doing that. So here's what happened. I had this money saved up when I moved down here. I, so I took some time off, wasn't working. What I didn't realize, Jeff, is that you got money saved up and you still spending like it's still coming in, but it's not coming in. It goes real fast. It's gone. And so my wife and I found ourselves in a situation, Jeff, where they repossessed the cars and they even repossessed the garbage can. <laughs> right? And um, when my wife called me and said, hey, baby, they took the garbage can. I said, well, they must be giving us a new one. She said, I don't know. So I called up, you know, the Senate, uh, garbage people. I said, hey, look, the garbage truck came by and they took the garbage can. You know, I think they made a mistake. And he said, no, Mr. Coleman, we didn't make a mistake. You didn't pay the $35. When you get $5, we would get you a new can. Oh, man. And it messed me up, Jeff, because I didn't have $35. Wow, well, so you went from real high down to another real low. Nothing, nothing. Not, look, Jeff, my wife and I was looking through the couch for change to figure out how we're going to feed our daughter. Oh, no. Okay? Yeah, I, I remember returning a $500 vacuum back to the store just to give my daughter a Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I, I told my wife, I said, hey, look, I'm going to send you down to Florida with your parents. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to figure this out. My wife like, nah, we both going to figure this out. If we all got to sleep in the car together, then we all got to sleep in the car together. Wow. And so one day my wife said, won't you call Eric? I said, I'm not calling Eric. Eric sell life insurance. And my wife said, boy, if you don't call Eric, <laughs> it's going to be a problem. My motto is happy, happy, happy wife, life. happy life. Yep. And so I called him up. Here's what I asked him. I said, yo, man, you still doing that insurance business? He said, yeah. You still making six figures? He said, yeah. I said, what I got to do? And I asked him, before I asked him what I got to do, I said, do I got to harass friends and family to make money? He said, no. I said, what I got to do? And I signed up, right? Went right. to a meeting. And my very first meeting I went to, right, was the same day I signed up, right? Because I signed up right after that. I stopped him in the hallway. And um, I said, yo, man, am I going to make some money in this in this, in this insurance thing? He said, yeah, I got you. I said, okay, I'm in. Then let's go. See, and when, when I got, when I took my test, I got through the course in three days, but I messed around and fell the doggone course by one question. Now, keep oh, in man. mind, Jeff, I did not even have, between my wife and I, we did not even have $90 to take the state exam at the time. Right. I called my sister. I said, hey, look, I need to borrow $90 to take the state exam to get my life insurance license, right? I said, I promise you I'll give it back to you, right? And so my sister gave me the money. I fell a test. Now you got to wait two weeks and pay another 90. Oh, I no. called the school and said, hey, look, um, I can't afford to pay for the test. Can y'all please cover me to take the retest? I missed it by one point. Ironic. See, I'm always thinking outside the box, Jeff. So right. ironically, the school said, yeah, we'll do that for you. Go back, take the test, passed it. Now I get hit with, wait a minute. I got a record. How's that going to work? I got a record. Mm -hmm. So once again, I'm an outside the box thinker, Jeff. So mm -hmm. when I do my application, I did not lie my application. I disclosed everything, right? 
you know, what you think? I got caught with a half kid. Co- I got caught with a half a kid of cocaine. I got caught with eight guns. I got caught with yeah. hollow, hollow tip bullets, everything, right? And so I disclosed this on my application. But when I say I'm always an outside the box thinker, I attach my resume to yeah, my uh, mm-hmm. to my application. And from the time I had been home from 97 to 2015 when I came home, I always been I always been employed. Right. Right? I always been employed outside of when I when I had left uh Best Buy to move down here. I got a very impressive resume. You know, a whole bunch of accolades in corporate America, innovation awards, all this stuff. And attached it. Jeff, the day I sent it in, the next day they issued me my life insurance license. Okay, so you got your insurance license and, and you did your background check and you passed your background check and they gave you your license. So what happened next? Hey, hey Jeff, look, I, I got my license. I got some leads, made some phone calls and I set up my very first appointment, right? Wrote the guy. Three days later, $910 hit my checking account. Jeff, you got to understand, I was jacked up. My wife and I had no money. I told my wife, I said, look, we about to get rich. She was like, off this show, we about to get rich from this insurance business. Yes, absolutely. And I just took off running, Jeff. That year, I hit rookie of the year. I became, I was the number two uh, recruiter for the year and everything. You know, um, you know, uh, my first full county, I made almost $170,000. And, it was, and, and, and being in corporate America and then working for yourself 1099, you might, although I made great six figures in corporate America, it was different when it was 1099 because it, it was all the money, mm-hmm. right? It was all the I was able to, you know, buy a brand new car and everything. I mean, I mean, I don't have Mercedes Benz, fur coats, alligator shoes, Gucci this, Louis <laughs> that. In fact, this watch I got on, on my wrist right now. Uh, Jeff, this this watch is a six thousand dollar watch. Yeah, you know, and, and it's all Incredible. because of this insurance industry and being humble and allowing myself to be mentored by people that was better than me. That's what I was going to say. I said you just didn't take off all of a sudden. You had to have um, some people help, and you you had the attitude. It sounds like of, hey, um, I'm humble. Train me the right way show me the right way, and you listened. Here's what I understood, Jeff. Your paycheck was bigger than mine. I don't care if you was a man or a woman. I don't care if you was black, white, Asian, Chinese, whatever the case may be. You could teach me something. Plus, I'm a a firm believer that everybody I come in contact with, I can learn from. That's That's what it is for me. So yeah, I humbled myself. I allowed myself to be mentored. And the people that was mentoring me, Jeff, I knew they wasn't telling me anything that's going to be detrimental to me because if it was detrimental to me, it was detrimental to them. Right. Because they had so to that whole you. that whole and that whole that whole trust thing had to be there. Here's what I will tell you. You know, I was okay with trusting what they was teaching me, right? And everything. But to get to the point where I was like, yo, this my man, whatever, you know, that shield was still up because at the end of the day. I'm still from the streets and you just don't trust anybody because, you know, people be moving sideways and stuff like that. In the back of you, back of your mind, you saying they want to help me. Do they have an arterial motive and everything? But yeah. when you start to grow, right, through, through so when you start to when you start to grow and you start to work on yourself through self-development, you start to realize you be, and you start to be able to see the different characteristics, uh, traits that people have, whereas though they truly have a vested interest in your well-being to help you succeed in life. And now you got to open it and embrace it with open arms. So so you got a legit way to make the money. Um, and, and it seems to be producing better than even working at a corporate job. And things you're following, um, some good mentors that do have your back. Uh, tell me about this personal development that you mentioned a couple of times. How does that work and what really... What, what things did you do to help you in that area? Hey, I, I, from the first time I read uh, um, uh, John Maxwell, Every People Lost a Leadership, and I, I was intrigued by it, right? And so at that point, I became an avid reader, 
right? And so, and working in corporate America, one of the things that corporate America taught me to do too was read. And then also, you know, dibbling, dabbling in, in the network marketing industry, the network marketing industry, hey, it's the, it's the industry out there where they don't pretty much care about your background, right? And, um, and, and Donald Trump and Robert Kiyosaki's book, why we want you to be rich, right? They talk about how the network marketing industry is the only industry where you're going to have a small initial investment. Right. You're going to get unlimited um, self-development and you have unlimited income earning potential. Right. So I, I found myself attracted to that industry, made some money in that industry and everything. And in fact, I also do a little bit of network marketing still on the side as another business vehicle because I come to learn the name of the game is multiple streams of income. It ain't just one stream, right? And so uh, once you start, once I started working on myself and learning things and being able to put things out there and watch it come to fruition and understand everything is up here, Everything changed. As Einstein said, hey, look, your uh, imagination is a preview of your life's coming attractions. So it's mm -hmm. like, what are you what are you imagining? See, when I was out there in those streets, I was imagining me out there doing everything I had no business doing. Hey, here's what the outcome is going to be. And guess what? That's what manifested itself. When mm -hmm. I imagined me making six figures in corporate America, guess what? That's what, it ma that's, that's what manifested itself. When I imagined me working for myself and becoming successful in this insurance industry, that's what manifested itself. Wow. But did it take work? Yeah, it took work. It took focus, right? Mm -hmm. It took a focus. And here's what you got to understand. As Jim Rome say, hey, the same wind that blows on everybody else's cell blows on your cell, and that's called the wind of life. Mm -hmm. How fast it stick depends on how fast you move. Right. See, here's here's where we here's where a lot of people I know that have the same background as me. Here's what I notice where they get caught up at. They understand up here, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Hey. There's an opportunity. There's a window with an opportunity, and I want to take advantage of it. I believe in myself. I can do it. But then they go and they share that and have that conversation with some of their peers. And peers are like, nah, man, you can't do that, man. You and know, shoot them down. Oh, you like you, you like us, man. Ain't nobody going to give you a shot. You know, you ain't got no college education. You, think you ain't got no us. skill sets. Yep. Right. The crab mm -hmm. in the bucket mentality. But what's important we have to understand, because I had to learn that my dream was my dream. It wasn't nobody else's. And I couldn't expect other people to be as excited for me and my dream as I was. Right. I also had to understand, hey, it's not important that they buy my story. What's important is I did not buy their story by telling me I can't do it. That's the key right there. Let me tell you something, Jeff. So as soon as I started having success in this industry working for me, here's what I say. Oh, I knew you can do it. I believe <laughs> you. You changed your tune. <laughs> like, what? Get out of my face. Where you was at? <laughs> yeah. That is hilarious. That is hilarious. Well, let me um, let me get to some questions that the students asked me to ask you. Okay. Uh, and stuff, or ask the, the people that I interview um, and things. So, um, Karen, Karen, and I can't give you their last names because okay. it's so funny. But Karen asks, um, and now Karen is um, is a high school, is a senior, and she has some doubts about, um, uh, you know, what to what to quit things and that kind of stuff. And then you know what? How do you overcome failure? Is basically what she's trying to overcome. Okay, so she's that's the root of this one. Is were you ever in a situation that made you stop trying, and how did you overcome it? So you can sort of see her mindset or where she's at. Right. So have I ever been since that made me stop that that made me want to stop trying? Right. And then how uh, did you over how did you overcome that? Absolutely. So when when I was in right before I got involved in the insurance industry, right? Um I'm looking for a job, Jeff, right? And nobody in Atlanta wants to give me a job because they say I'm overqualified because uh, of my vast you know, retail experience mm -hmm. in the Mecca, New York City. And the, they know, hey, you're a district manager in New York City, Manhattan. You're you making big money. money. We can't mm -hmm. afford you down here. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, got, it got to the point, 
to where it's dark, I was like, man, I'm just about to say, forget looking for a job. I'm about to go back to these streets. Oh, no. Right? And so I called my brother and had a conversation with my brother and let him know what I was thinking, what I was feeling. And my brother, now this is my baby. He's, he's, he's next to the baby brother, right? Right. He, he, he said to me, he said, man, you bigger than that. Wow. You more than that. You got a wife, you got a family that depends on you. Your wife, your, he said, your, your daughter, your do- I have two daughters and a son. Your daughters and your son, they look at you as a role model. Mm-hmm. What kind of example would you set if you went out there and went back to the same thing and this time you get life in prison or this time get killed. you get shot and get mm-hmm. killed? Yeah. What kind of what, what kind of example would you be setting for them? How, how would they look at their dad? Because right now, all you see is an immediate fix. You got to look at the big picture. Right. And you're looking and, at you think, the temporary problem. I was it, right. And, and exactly. thinking it's going to last forever and really mm-hmm. it'll just last for a time period. You don't know when yep. it's going to end, but it does end, you know, have the peaks and yep. valleys. <laughs> and right. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I remember getting off the phone with him. And I said, God, I tried it my way. Mm-hmm. Your way. Let your will be done. Amen. Whatever you send my way, that's what I'm going to do. And so, so that that's what made me not quit and give up in, in regards to what's going to happen. Because here's what happens, uh, Jeff. We want what we want when we want it and how we want it. Unfortunately, guess what? God don't work that way. Right. God give it to us on his terms and his time. Yep. Right. And yep. he give uh, he put us in the situation so that we get to make the right decision. So, like, I thought I would never, ever do life insurance. because Mind you, I turned it down two years prior. Mm-hmm. And so when I was having this success in it, Jeff, I had a conversation with God. I said, mm-hmm. God, I don't have no experience in this. Yep. Why am I having this success? And God spoke to me, said, it's because you're helping people. That's what I was going to say. So you have to provide real value to the marketplace in order to get paid well. And and so you can't. And that's the part that people miss. People think it's about the money. Mm -hmm. No, your income is a direct, is a direct reflection on the service that you provide that has value. That's what it boils down to. I keep telling people it's your knowledge that you have and the skills that you have. Both of those together, you know, produce what you're going to get paid for. You know, you got to solve somebody's problem. You know, and all a job is, whether you're working for yourself or working for the man, is you're solving somebody's problem. problem. Absolutely. Solve a problem. And the more problems you can solve, the more complex they are, the uh, the more you're going to get compensated. You know, one of the things I say every day, uh, Jeff, is that I'm so happy and grateful now that I give more in use value than I receive in cash with the people that I come in contact with. Wow. Every day. That's, that's incredible. Well, yeah. let's get, let's go here. One more question. Um, let's see. Uh, we got, um, we got, we got Shuri. Now she's a young lady. Um, and she's real confused about her future. Now, uh-huh. she, now she's, she's a great gal. I did let you know up front. She's, she's very smart and stuff, but she just doesn't know what she wants to do. And she's scared. And she's asking, did you always know what you wanted to do? You know, when you're in high school, you know, how did that, how did that work out? Cause she's thinking that she's supposed to know. And I've told her what I think, but you know, and I haven't gone over these questions with you either. Right. We haven't gone over these questions. So, <laughs> so what would you tell her just knowing that what I just told you? Being, being afraid is okay. And, and in fact, it's normal. Mm-hmm. Because if you're not if you're not afraid, then that might be the problem. That if you're not afraid, here's why I say being afraid is okay. It's normal because you're going to you're about to embark on a journey that you never embarked on before. Right. And knowing what it is you want to do, if you if you look at the statistics, probably about seventy five to eighty percent, and the number could be a little bit higher, of people that make a decision of what they're going to major in 
in college end up switching their major. Yeah, so exactly. and I, and I use I use my oldest daughter as an example. My oldest daughter, she's now 30. She has a master's. She's a mental health counselor, drug and alcohol counselor, right? Mm -hmm. When she went to school, initially, she wanted to be a doctor. By her, by the end of her sophomore year in college, going into her junior year, she changed the major. So it yes. happens. And here's, here's the other thing. When you go back and look at the majority of your successful millionaires and billionaires, probably less than 1% of them is doing what they did in school. Right. And most of them never even went on to obtain a degree to after they made their money. Hey, I like what Dr. Dennis Kimbrough say. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough said, hey, look, a degree will get you a job, but common sense and make you a fortune. So yes, be right. okay, be okay with being scared. Just also be okay with taking chances. See, I'm a firm believer, a person who say they never had a chance because they never took a chance. That's right. Yeah. Right. The, the other thing I, 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 what I told her is um, the reason why you're scared is because you care. Yeah, you know, I said, I said, you know, you see these thoroughbred horses in the race, they're in that chute, they're all jumping and nervous and all get up. And then when it takes off, they just bolt, right? They because go. they're, they're, they're thoroughbred. They can't, you know, they know something's happening. And that to me means that you're a thoroughbred. You know, you're nervous, agree, you're ready to go. I agree with you, I agree with and, you 100%. And now, as soon as you get that thing going, you're going to take off and you're going to be just fine. Um, as long as you have good character, good values, um, and some mentors, you know, that, that are Absolutely. pointing in the right way, you're going to do just fine. Listen it's, to the right people. Right. And and, and one thing I, I would I would say to her, and I think, uh, I think Steve Harvey did it good. You just got to jump, right? You jump off the cliff. You got the parachute on your back. You don't know when it's going to come out, right. but you know it's going to come out and save you. Are you going to get scrapes and bruises down the way you jump off the cliff? You're going to get that, yep. but the parachute is going to come out and save you. And understand that your mind has to be like a parachute. If it ain't open, it's not going to work. Right. I say to this young lady, go out there, be afraid, but jump. Jump. Do something, learn Never some new skills, chance. take a chance, learn some new skills wherever you're at, do your best you can, learn what you can, take that, move on to the next place. And, Absolutely. And, and, and let your dream go. Uh, Alec, uh, Alexa um, is another another nice student of mine. Um, she, he says, um, how do you stay on track? Because he gets distracted and just gets, you know, procrastinates and you know, all that kind of stuff. So how do you stay on track? That's a really, that's a really, really great question because so many, so many people struggle with staying on track. Here's how I stay on track. Everything for me is a schedule. Ah. Okay. I, I like, I like to schedule everything. Now, if something comes up, then I know at that point I have to, and you know, we were trying to get this thing, but things came up because of what was happening. Right. Yeah. So I'm always rescheduling what has to come up, but I, I, I understand you know, and, you know, and they probably get to this in life, but I understand my A activities, my B activities, my C activities, and my D, E activities. Actually, they know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, great. I, ta I, Fantastic. Taught them, I taught them all about how to use a Franklin planner. Okay, they, great. They all Fantastic. got certified in Franklin planner. So they know it. Great. A, so, yeah. A1s, A2s, A B1s. B2s. That's fantastic. So, great. So that, that's what I use. Everything for me is about schedule, right? And it keeps me on track. The other thing is I'm asking myself this when it comes down to staying on track is what I'm doing in this precise moment in time. Is it getting me closer to my dreams and goals or is it taking me away from my dreams and goals? Great question. If some okay. clients, they're, they're scared to ask themselves those tough questions. Right. And you got to be willing to ask yourself those tough questions. And my wife would tell you, um, like getting in this business so many people had invited us to things and my answer was no it's not that i didn't want to go but me going was not getting me closer to what i wanted to get accomplished right so i was okay with saying no now and be able to later on take advantage of everything do what i want to do and and that's and that and that's part of being able to stay on track 
get a vivid picture in your mind of what you want to get accomplished. And you got to become a no person. And what do I mean by that? If anybody asks you to do something and what they asking you to do, or to, if it's not part of your agenda to get you what you want or where you want to be, then the answer is no, I can't do it. No, I can't, I can't attend. Period. Because at the end of the day, you're responsible for you. That's right. In in, in the, the the concept of delayed gratification is a very big, big conference and in the law of the harvest comes in there where you plant mm -hmm. seeds and they have to get plant seeds. Yep. You gotta got let them grow. You All know. right, well, let's move on to so the next thing is I'm going to take you back in time. Okay. okay you're going to enter in a little time machine. I'm going to hit a button, and, I, and <laughs> it's going to transport you to any point in the in your past when you're in high school. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what the kids want to know and what I want to know is what time period would you go back to in high school? And you're going to go see yourself, but you have all this experience and all this knowledge now that you have right now going to go back in time talk to young young james uh when would you go back and what would you tell that little guy uh i would go back to my freshman year at high school mm -hmm. and tell that younger version of james that hey you need to understand financial literacy uh -huh. and the impact that it will have on your life and your kids life for generations to come because it's not taught in school. It's not taught at the colleges. Right. We don't understand financial literacy. And because we don't understand financial literacy, what we tend to do is what we learn from our parents. Who are broke. <laughs> we, right. We have, we, have, we, have these, yep. we have these paradigms that we believe in because we have parents say, money don't grow on trees. We can't afford that. And it stays with us. But if we, if we was taught financial literacy and, and, and understand how it worked and how to put ourselves in position, hey, to make our money work for us, how to make this money, let me put this part away, let me invest this part, mm -hmm. you know, or even put this part in an investment account till I get enough capital built up to go make my first investment. That's what I will be telling the young James at 14 years old. And the reason I say at 14 years old, because here's what I understand, between the age of 12 and 17, that's when kids are most impressionable. Right. So if I got to go back between the high school years, I'm going to take it right to my freshman year. Right. That sounds great. Great answer. Great answer. All right. So now the last question is, um, what piece of advice do you have for them that they can take and really um, use that could possibly help them in their future? What, what would you tell them? A few things. The first thing I would tell them is that you can't accomplish what your brain can't conceive. If you can conceive the thought, it's a matter of bringing that thought into existence. Stumbling blocks are only opportunities. And when, opp and when opportunities present itself, you take advantage of those opportunities, you know? But if you can conceive it, you can achieve it. You just gotta believe right here that you can achieve it. The other thing I will tell them is that somebody is counting on them to be the best version that they can be. Somebody is banking on them to show up. And it may be them themselves that's counting on them. It may be their little brother or their little sister. It may even be their parents that's counting on them mm -hmm. to show up and be that better version, to be that beacon, to be that light, to be that person that's going to make the change, that's going to transcend from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. But they got to believe in themselves. They got to believe that there is a bigger and better version of them inside of themselves. And it is deserving to come out. They, I'm giving them permission to let it come out. The third thing I would tell them is that, hey, you do not have to be a product of your environment. I, I give you permission today to get outside that mental gated community. What mental gated community am I talking about? That mental gated community where I'm not good enough lives. That mental gated community where fear lives. That mental gated community is I'm destined to fail live. That mental gated community where if that's all my parents are gonna be, that's all I'm gonna be. That mental gated community where scarcely live, where lack lives, where guess what? Jealousy live, where intimidation live, where that's not for me live, or where I'm not smart enough live. I don't have the education. Live. I'm giving you permission to get outside that gated community. You can leave that gated community at any time that you choose to make a decision to leave that gated community. Walk out of that gated community and never look back. 
Greatness is inside of you. You were designed to be a warrior. You designed to be a conqueror. You were designed to get everything that is put on this earth for you to have. You deserve it. You got to believe in yourself that you deserve it. You got to go out there and get it. And you got to stand tall. And you understand when you make your mind up to be successful, there's going to come pushback and opposition. And you got to be okay with those pushbacks and opposition because there's greatness inside of you. There's a better version of the man inside of you. There's a better version of the woman inside of you. Your kids, your future kids is looking at this. And you owe it to them because you owe it to yourself. Right, it's the self-respect that you got to have. Exactly right. That is fantastic, man. I would just want to just cheer you on and stuff. I feel like I want to go back to high school now and start over myself <laughs> a little bit. Hey, if um if somebody wanted to 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 get into financial services or do something similar to what you're doing, um, or, I mean, how do the, how does that happen? You know, what what, what kind Easy, of process man. do they got to do? So, it, it's it's real simple. First, they got to be 18 years of age, right? And it's a, them taking a 40 hour online course. Right. 40 hour online, online course. We can give them the discount code where it'll cost them 50 bucks wow. to take the course. And as kids, they might not have the $50 to take the course. Hey, look, not a big deal. We could put some kind of scholarship program to get together to pay for for them, right? right? Pay for them to get their license and everything and, and take them and put them in this program to get them out there to start making some serious money. Somebody brand new coming into this financial services industry, Jeff, I can show them how to go out there and take care of two clients a week at $50, you know, on a monthly premium and make $50,000 a year. Wow. I can, show, I can show them how to go out here if they coach with everything, how to come right out of high school and make six figures without a college education. See, there's, there's nothing special about what it is we do. What's special, Jeff, is making a commitment. Right. Right. And doing See, the work. For me, commitment is transcending words into action and making time when there is no time. Okay, so we, 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 we can get them started. Wow. If they want to get started and make some money, we can get them started. If any of your students, Jeff, need to reach out and talk to me, you know, because we have sim similar backgrounds, mm -hmm. they can reach out and talk to me. I can, I, I can tell them what it is and get them to understand, look, you don't have to be a product of your mind. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be.